Hey guys, welcome to the We Need to Calm Down podcast. I'm Devin. And I'm Joe. And this is the show where we talk about all things Taylor Swift. That's right. This is the show where two friends finally get to let their dedication to our favorite pop singer, pop idol, pop icon, and like every other genre icon, uh, Taylor Swift fly. Yes, we'll be discussing everything from song breakdowns, Taylor news, and our insane fan theories. And speaking of Taylor news, holy moly, has this woman had a week? It's been, like, this whole era has just been, like, a whirlwind of just, mm-hmm. like, this insane stuff. Every other day, I feel like I'm getting something new Taylor-oriented. Like, it's insane. And we're over here worried about, like, but what if she doesn't give us more content? And we have not really had to worry long this entire era. We, we like... We made a whole production schedule of, like, episodes we want to do and everything. And then, like, it feels like every week we have to push them back because she did something new, like a Rolling Stone interview or 24-hour concert release on Disney+. Plus. Like, it's always something new every single week. Yeah, so let's sum up this past week really quick. So she won the AMA Artist of the Year Award. No, no biggie, you know, just Artist of the Year, cool. Uh, the Grammy nominations came out, and she has six different nominations for Best Song Written for Visual Media, which was Beautiful Ghost from Cats, and then all the other five. Best Pop Solo Performance for Cardigan, Best Pop Vocal Album for Folklore, Best Pop Duo Group Performance for Exile, Album of the Year, Folklore, Song of the Year, Cardigan. Like, holy moly, that is a lot of awards. There's there's so much to break down here a little bit. I don't think we have time to go into everything. I think number one, I did not care for beautiful cats or beautiful cats, beautiful ghosts uh, in cats. Sorry, not my cup of tea. Um, I did not. I recognized two other albums on the best album of the year award. Is that normal? Yeah. Okay, good. I, I was like, Devin's like the big music person. If anyone recognizes it, it would be her. But like, I, I'm sitting here, I'm like, I know Hollywood's bleeding. I like that. It's a great album by Post Malone. I've heard nothing but praise for Dua Lipa's album. Shocked that, well, The weekend got snubbed, obviously, and everyone's talking mm-hmm. about it. Also, just Lady Gaga got snubbed on Album of the Year. Yeah. Are you kidding me? Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, that's the one that's shocking me the most. I don't know. I love Gaga. I, Chromatica wasn't it for me, though. Really? Okay. Yeah, I've but- had a lot of people coming like Chromatic is amazing. It's a great album, blah, blah. And I'm like, it wasn't my cup of tea. Yeah. Um, Fine Line, I think was nominated. Okay. <clears throat> as much as I love Cardigan, Song of the Year, I'm kind of like up against yeah. the other contenders. I'm kind of like, I, I think know. that I think they had to go with Cardigan. Like, I think regardless, it was going to end up being gen- one random song from uh, Folklore. Cause I don't think, I don't think any of her songs were, there were no singles. So like they couldn't no. point to a single. I think if they were, and Cardigan was the closest thing to a single they had. Yeah. Cause it actually Cardigan was a single. It was because mm-hmm. they released, released the actual single. So they, I think just on that metric is the only reason they had to do that. I think if they were to pick song of the year based on popularity of these songs, I think the one would probably be up there uh, or Betty would probably be the two that would. Um, I, think I don't think they're as, as mainstream as Cardigan is though. I think Betty's more mainstream because it hit more more markets and it was the one yeah. song she performed on the Country Music Awards. I think True. I think more people know Betty than Cardigan. Um, I heard Exile at a bar. Hmm. Like it was a while, it was a little while ago. It was like two months ago or something. But like Wow. Like it blew me away. I was like, I was having a conversation with my friends and I'm like, whoa, 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 stop talking. <laughs> Like, is this exile like i was like blown away because yeah. i'm like of all songs on cardigan why is exile being played in a bar um but yeah no i don't know i think i think she can probably get at least three of these i think she, oh yeah she get album of the year i think something's really wrong with all the records that out that this, this uh, album has broken this year mm-hmm. i can't imagine her biggest competition i think is post malone and I don't. I just don't think his album no. is nearly. It's great. Don't get yeah. me wrong. That album is mm-hmm. very, very good. But folklore just broke so many records this year. It's the only yeah. al- album of the year to hit a million purchases. I think, uh, as of the time of recording this, probably, like just on accolades alone, 
there's no mm-hmm. way this album doesn't win at least one Grammy. Oh God, yeah, I think at least one. If I think, not, I can't imagine she beats "Rain on Me" for "Exile" or for best pop duo. Yeah. Performance. Um, vocal album, yeah, she has to win best written song or vocal album. I don't know what her competition is, but I assume that's got to be up there. If she wins album of the year, there's no way she can't win. That's, that's pretty bad. If she wins album of the year, it's like, yeah, this album was the album of the year, but it wasn't the best vocal album of the year. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Either or. What are you thinking? Well, I think she's definitely going to win best song written for visual media. Um, okay. I think album of the year she's got. I don't think song of the year. I don't think pop duo. Pop vocal maybe. Pop solo performance maybe. I can see. I can see. Like I mean, the vocal performance in Cardigan's really good. Yeah. Um, I like I said. I think she gets fifty percent. That's good. That's 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 our Grammy prediction. Yeah. Uh, we predict fifty percent of these awards are going to go to Taylor. Mm-hmm. Uh, she also won uh, Apple Songwriter of the Year or something too. It was mm-hmm. another accolade she randomly won. Uh, because Tay just slay but yeah and then on top of that she had an interview with Good Morning America I think she has another interview coming up potentially I forget with what magazine but yeah she dropped a whole Disney Plus special with less than 24 hours notice again so let's talk about it today that's going to be our our the meat of our topic today is we're going to talk about uh, folklore the long pond studio sessions on disney plus and can we just talk about how she always announces it while i'm driving <laughs> and i get so mad because i'm literally just driving to work and then someone texts me and i'm like well crap now i gotta well now i gotta go look at it and then i freak out and i'm like i gotta make all these posts i gotta i gotta write about it i gotta and i just start ranting in the car via snapchat <laughs> you did send me those you mm-hmm. sent me just like Devin, just like i this this freaking woman just posting all this stuff and making my job harder like <laughs> and i love like because i sleep soundly like a baby mm-hmm. uh, i just always wake up to text from you of like i i think what was the one you said you're like i assume you're ignoring me because you died from the news <laughs> if that's okay i did too <laughs> <laughs> all right no it it was it was a, it was an awesome thing to hear i'm glad we woke up to it uh she she announced it with what what was it 24 minus 11 equals 13 or something oh yeah what was, was like the, yeah like, something like that something taylor-esque 13 something very taylor-esque yeah mm-hmm. So, all right, Devin, tell me some quick facts about this movie. So, it was released on Disney Plus on November 25th at midnight PST. So, for us ESTers over here, 3 a.m. Uh, it was an hour oh, hour and 45 minutes. I think it was like 106 Roughly, yeah. minutes runtime. The special was actually shot in September. So... I bet not. you she told, her, uh, she told her label one week before they wanted to put it up. <laughs> like by the way we're gonna we're gonna record the special so basically in the feature taylor is joined by aaron desner jack antonoff and a virtual justin vernon to perform the album in an enti- entirety for the very first time so this was the first time all three of them were in the same room together bringing the magic of this album to life and they gave commentary about each of the 17 songs right before they performed them it was recorded at Long Pond Studio, which is located in New York Hudson's Valley. Uh, apparently, it's Aaron Desner's studio. This is Taylor's first directorial debut. This is her first piece, and it was produced by Taylor Swift Productions, which is also responsible for the Reputation Stadium Tour, City of Lover, Speak That World Tour, that kind of stuff. Okay, uh, th- awesome. Yeah. The music from the special is now available on all streaming platforms as Folklore, the Long Pond Studio Sessions from the Disney Plus special, Deluxe Edition. And it is not censored, so you can listen to all her F.U. Forevers on there. Um, What's what's interesting, too, is, yeah, no, so Taylor had directed music videos before, like The Man and stuff like that, but this is like her first full feature length Mm -hmm. style movie. 
And honestly, from um, we're gonna we're gonna transition into our first impressions from the watch. But one thing that was really interesting was I didn't we, we didn't know it was directed by Taylor until we got to the credits. We had no idea. And we while we were talking, we we watched this together, just like live texting each other throughout the whole thing. Um, mm-hmm. And we both kept commenting on the cinematography. Like it was really well shot. We were pointing out like granted don't get me wrong we're not movie majors by any stretch we don't know anything about cinematography or anything but at least Mm -hmm. for us novices we thought it was a pretty well um contrasting colors like very cool Mm -hmm. shots and very cool transitions that we really enjoyed um sorry my cat just jumped into my lap and i can't say no to that so Mm -hmm. this is gonna happen during the episode um yeah no so i thought that was all really cool and like you said we learned so much about this show or this album from this and that was something i wasn't expecting Mm -hmm. i was very thrilled to see well quick jump off point from you talking about the cinematography i didn't realize that they just set up this giant camera arm like rotational thing in the studio so they don't have anyone filming. They, you know, they set it up themselves and it's just really? this camera that kind of pans so you can see all of them performing and that's how they edited it. I think it's called a jib shot. I think is what that Maybe. is. A jib, a camera jib. Mm-hmm. Um, no, it's, it's insane. Like, and it was really like, it was really well done. Like for, in my opinion, um, and like I said, we learned so much. So what were your first impressions uh, from what we, from our first watch? Uh, so just some standout moments from it. The home studio Taylor recordings of just her like, hey, you know, and it's so funny to me to think that she's never had to record at home because she's always had access to studios. And so this is the first time she's ever had to create a home studio. Like you would think that she would just have a home studio at this yeah. point, at an artist of her caliber. But no, she had to create her own, which she thought was awesome. But you just see cats fighting in the background on her bed, um, her like, you know, recording the album, playing instruments. And then <laughs> poor Laura, just like in the other room, her recording engineer, just like, hey, I'm good, I'm ready. <laughs> like, let's do it. Wearing a mask and all that. Um, just the fact that Taylor is just so casually cursing is also- Oh my gosh. A very, like we were talking about this last episode with Rolling Stone. Yeah. She just keeps dropping them in there and like everything she's doing, like she, it just seems like she's looking for ways to interject and just like proclaim to the world, Hey, I'm a normal person. I'm not that innocent young girl that you remember from speak now and that kind of stuff. Like I curse Mm -hmm. and like, like not even just like I do it in certain scenarios. Like, no, I casually curse. Like I, I say, I say things all the time and like we get, a decent amount from this on a Disney plus we didn't get everything we thought, but um, we do get a lot of uh, casual cursing, which like, I think we pointed out in the last episode goes a long way to seeing what she's going to do with these re-records. If she's going to incorporate, could you imagine if she did that? If we got Mm -hmm. a fearless with an explicit tag on it or something like along those lines, I'm not saying hundred percent is what's going to happen, but like, it's, it's interesting for music going forward. I think we're going to see a much less inhibited Taylor. I think we're going to get more explicit warnings on future albums. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think we're going to, we might get more than th- like two instances of an F word in an album, 100%. Hmm. Perhaps that might be, I don't know. I don't know if she would add cursing to her, you know, younger I think self. mostly for the all too well. Mostly yeah, for the all too hopefully. well. Yeah, hopefully. Yeah. Uh, another standout moment was just throughout the entire special, this woman and her hand motions. Oh my gosh. I am her. She is me. <laughs> I do the same exact things. Uh, uh, just lifting the hand and conducting yourself. Basically. Yeah. It's just, I was living for it. Uh, also living for her outfits, that whole velvet shirt she had going on the red one that looked great on her. I just, think she looks fantastic my mom was like i don't like her bangs okay so i agree with your mom honestly um it's really interesting i again i have as a as a man i don't really have any say or like 
I don't. I think my opinion may, matters less, specifically in this instance. But personally, I think this is my least favorite era style-wise. I love the imagery that's coming from it, like uh, like Devin's background folklore. I love the sepia style. I like all that stuff. But the outfits that she's been in, uh, her bangs and hair, like things like that, um, they're not my favorite. Um, my like I said again, mm-hmm. my opinion doesn't matter. Uh, I'm not telling Taylor the right way to dress or anything like that. I think it fits very well for the era. I uh, love but it. Just sty- but stylistically, it's just not my cup of tea. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm definitely more of the lover era. I'm more of the um, red and speak now stylistic choices that she's made. Those are like my uh, preferred styles. So this one's definitely a little odd for me. And it wasn't something that stood out to me. It was something I was, if if I'm being honest, probably just actively trying to overlook and just focus on the words because it's just not something that does anything for me oh i love it it's like so indie alternative like just folk kind of vibe i love it i love the very like i'm not gonna get all glitz and glammed i'm just gonna be this folksy girl who's in a little cottage and i I love it i love that vibe don't get me wrong she's still Mm -hmm a flawless individual and pulls it off better than anyone I could imagine. Um, But yeah, no. Yeah. And then also I just, I love that, you know, she's improvising some new runs or she's giving stress to a couple different lines or even adding a line. Like, I just like that this kind of added a little bit more. That's the part that I enjoyed about this album. I enjoyed when she did add some new stuff rather than, just keeping it the same as we're going to talk about in a couple of seconds. Yeah, no, her runs were insane for this one. I liked doing the new things because I think that was a big fear that we both had going into this was that it was going to be the same thing. Like it was just going to be, mm-hmm. all right, well, we're just going to hear the same version of the song. Nothing's really going to change. Not only her runs though. Uh, and like you said, stressing different lines, but like there were also different like musical pieces too. Like Aaron mm-hmm. improvised a lot. Uh, Jack improvised a bit like there were things that made there were there were definitely some performances where we didn't see any of that which was a little upsetting but I feel like the over like the majority of them were unique experiences and very different um, that definitely made it feel a lot better and and unique and gave us something new out of it which I think is awesome yeah so if you do want to go into what our favorite performances were definitely um i think i I, i'm shocked this isn't your favorite but i'm also not at the same time Mm -hmm. i think august was the standout um performance it was electric it was really fun you could tell they're having fun seeing it you can tell they were excited playing it jack especially looked like a giant goober Mm -hmm. playing the song um definitely a standout for me uh, I think one of the comments that I made while we were watching the show was this this special made me realize I don't think I want to see these songs performed at us in a stadium. Like I just yeah. don't want to see it. And I think August August was the only one that I was I was okay. Next stadium tour, I hope of all the songs she play, she has on this album, she plays that one. And that it. That's it. I completely agree. This is not a stadium album. I don't think it ever was. I think if anything, it's like a secret pop-up show in like a small club. Yeah, I completely agree. And that's what I think is interesting about it. And I'm interested to see where it goes. But I think, like I said, August is the only one. If if we get a tour in 2021, 2022, uh, and she plays all of her songs, I know she's going to play more than August, but I think August is what I'm really excited to hear in a, in a tour environment. Yeah. Uh, then my next favorite was Peace. Makes sense. My favorite song. Uh, I enjoyed listening to it, seeing her her facial expressions during it. Um, Exile was incredible. Mm-hmm. Um, Boney Vera coming in looked awesome, sounded awesome. Like they had like the the amazing duets that they did together. Like gave me life, sent me to heaven. Yeah. Um, they, they ad-libbed a bunch of stuff and just seeing them play off of each other. Weirdly, when they're not even in the same room, like they mm-hmm. played off each other so well virtually. Um, it was really cool to watch. 
Uh, and then I'm just going to give a special shout out to the lakes. I thought that was a really cool and interesting uh, yeah. performance that I really enjoyed. Mm-hmm. So piggybacking off of that, you know, talking about songs that just sounded very different. Like My Tears Ricochet was my top because you're not going to be able to recreate those orchestral like sounds. And so the fact that they went in this different direction, her voice just sounds so mature. Mm. It's just full of emotion and you just, it's so good. So good. That's my top song. Uh, August was not my number two because it is my favorite song off of the album. But again, just electric performance. Oh yeah. Ever since seeing it in the trailer, I knew that it was going to be one of my top songs. I'm like, I already yeah, know. Yeah. And You're then, watching Jack just go like crazy <laughs> on guitar. <laughs> yeah. And then Mirrorball was probably my third favorite, which is crazy because Mirrorball ranks kind of low for me, but just another song that you can't replicate that you have to do some kind of different instrumentation, I think really added to the song and really added to these themes of like anxiety and, you know, trying to please everybody. Yeah, definitely. So moving on to our least favorite performances. I think... I think we have a lot of these are pretty carbon copy, mm-hmm. but I think we have one shocker in here. Uh, for me, Epiphany and Seven, just because they're both my least favorite songs on the album. Um, I didn't. I I almost fell asleep during this uh, the rendition of Epiphany. It just wasn't for me. I know Devin thinks otherwise, mm-hmm. but it just it wasn't my cup of tea for that. Seven, I think was a lot better than Epiphany, but it was still lower ranking for me. Um, what are your two before we do the ones that we uh well actually I, we yeah yeah so seven and cardigan i feel like we, we both agreed upon and i'll throw my third one in there betty yeah again all great songs all songs that i thoroughly enjoy but i really didn't see that much of a difference i think cardigan we've heard like three different renditions at this point i'm okay with it seven it really feels like a carbon copy of the original, which I don't mind yeah. because I love yeah. the original, but in terms of just wowing me, it was okay. And then Betty, same as above, we've heard the two different versions. However, I did like this version a yeah. lot better than- the CMA's one? Yep. Yeah. I, I, I feel the same way. I think Cardigan is the big shocker for us mm-hmm. because it's just, it is what, I think we both ranked it abnormally high. It is one of our favorite songs on the album, but- it's just like you said, she didn't do anything different with it. Um, and I think honestly, I think I mentioned this right before we started recording, but like, I think cardigan, if, if I were to hear it in a jazz nightclub speakeasy kind of vibe era with her in a flapper dress in like that old metal microphone, Mm -hmm. I think I would lose my mind over it. I think it would be an amazing performance in that very specific setting but outside of that setting, it just feels very lackluster and just, or I don't even want to say lackluster, just very middle of the road, exactly yeah. what you'd expect, but not what you wanted kind of thing. I get that. So then my last question, is this what you expected out of the special? Is this what you expected out of the special? 100%. Really? I, I think that when they announced it, I wanted this like acoustic renditions of the song, which she pretty much gave to us. I wanted a little bit more in depth about what the songs meant. And I think she kind of, she- Oh, she delivered. She delivered and then she exceeded at certain songs. Oh yeah, definitely. Mm-hmm. I think I was about like 50% in that uh, I expected a lot worse out of the special. I expected, really? I expected City of Lover. And again, not to say City of Lover was bad, mm-hmm. but I expected like, well, I've already been burned with City of Lover before and ABC, Disney affiliates, everything like that. I assume we were going to get like a very, like, like I said, middle of the road. Everything's going to sound exactly the same. All we're going to do is just see her. I didn't expect the the in-depth interviews even from the trailer i was like oh they did like a nice little small interview in the beginning and then one Mm -hmm. at the end probably and it's just going to be like a mini concert i didn't expect half of what we got um but the deep dives into every song the interviews learning more more about aaron Dessner and his role in everything was really cool Mm -hmm. um unfortunately seeing jack was cool um but like it's having Taylor like really dive in uh, and, to, and to be completely honest, just talk at Aaron and Jack a lot. <laughs> well, 
it was so funny because I was reading an interview trying to just gain s- some facts for this episode and someone pointed out a really good just thought that when she was talking with Aaron Dessner they kind of brought out each other because she doesn't work with him that much so he was kind of questioning like oh what do you mean about this or yeah I was you know questioning you about this meanwhile with Jack he kind of feels like a yes man in terms of like yeah uh-huh I agree with you mm-hmm. oh, yeah, yeah 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 like he, like like he doesn't really bring anything out of her because they're I, just already so comfortable it's interesting I don't think he brings anything out of her but I do think he's still added to it a lot oh of yeah it. I think I think because I don't want to say like he didn't add he didn't bring anything out of her because it makes it sound like his presence was negative no um it his existence is no I'm just kidding um <laughs> Uh, his presence, like he added a lot to it. He he brought in things, and he he didn't bring he didn't pull a lot of things out of her. There were certain things that he mentioned that like that I'm gonna that we'll we'll talk about when we break down the rest of the video. But um, I think I think they both added so much. I loved hearing Aaron Dessner. I don't know why. Like we we were talking about this the whole time, but like you thought he looked like the Hound if he like starved himself for three day, for three months. And uh, it's gonna blast me like that on this episode. <laughs> I mean, you were right though. Like he does. After you said that, I could not see it. But for some reason, like his voice, like we mentioned, like it was, it felt very wiry, very weaselly. Not what we expected. But for some reason, I just loved listening to the guy talk. Like, I just don't listen to the national, so I had no indication either. about who Aaron Dessner was coming into this. Not, not even a little bit. But like, I, I don't know why. I can't pinpoint why I liked him so much. But it. It, I was just drawn to him. He was, he was very, it, it, I don't want to say he was charismatic. I don't mm-hmm. want to like, I don't want to like come out here and just like start throwing comments. Cause I don't know what it was. It was just something about him was really, was really cool to see. Yeah. He just seems friendly. Someone. I think, oh yeah. A hundred percent. He he seems like someone who would just like want to like help you. I don't mm-hmm. know. <laughs> I think for me, like the end of the day, I was blown away by the uh, by the songs and the or by the interviews and like the the speaking parts, but I was mildly underwhelmed by like a majority of the songs. It, gotcha. It, nothing. None of the songs really stood out to me that much, except for like my top performers. Um, I'm happy to have it. Don't get me wrong. I'd rather have this than not. But they didn't they didn't blow me out of the water, and I'm more excited to get the in depth analysis than I am the actual just replaying of the songs which yeah. i think is actually perfect for us and i think that's the you're very interested in the songs and the production and i'm just very interested in why did you write this mm-hmm. <laughs> we are going to analyze song by song all of the interviews that occurred during this performance yes and just mention things that jumped out to us all right so starting with the one uh this she in this one she did it, like it's cool she had like a bunch of different settings too Mm-hmm. Uh, and she would mix up the people she was talking to. So for this one, she was just with Aaron Dessner and she was in like, I think this was a velvet shirt interview. We'll call it that. Um, she confirmed that the opening uh, to the one I'm doing good. I'm on some new uh, is, is a double meaning. Like she, and she talked about that a lot. She was like on the, un, on the one hand, it's in the context of the song, you're updating a lover about yourself, how you're doing and all this stuff. But like in context of Taylor Swift herself, uh, she's speaking directly to the fans. Like she's telling us how she's doing uh, and that she's writing this new album. That's completely different than anything you've ever going to hear. What you're going to hear on this album. I'm doing good. This is new. Yeah. I've been saying uh, yes instead of no, trying been new saying things. Yes instead of no. Yeah. Trying new things and all of that stuff. Like it's cool to see that she kind of mentions that and mentions it right off the gate. Like one of the things that I think is really interesting about this album is because it's specifically not autobiographical she mentions that in the interviews it we can easily just say oh well then nothing in it is taylor swift oriented but we can easily see she definitely wrote a lot of these lines with that double meaning in in mind Mm -hmm. Um, from my tears ricochet to invisible string it's fun to know that she intentionally chose lyrics that fit with the theme of the album or the song but also fit with her life even when they aren't like i said directly autobiographical exactly So now moving on to the second track, Cardigan, Betty and James end up together. She just casually. She dropped that in August. Oh. In the August August interview. But I mean, we're not going to wait until August to bring that up. Are you kidding me? 
Like Betty and James actually got back together. That was like the most mind blowing revelation that she's just so casually. Granted, I guess to her, it's not that like mind blowing because she, she wrote it, Mm -hmm. but like, it's so nuts to me. And I think we actually mentioned this like as a possibility uh, back when we did our, our giant two parter on the love triangle. um, I think you mentioned specifically, like there were, points i'm trying to find them in our notes here but there were points that like pointed to the fact that they might get back together Mm -hmm. yeah i just don't know i I don't know i think that she's looking back on it in sadness like you know (laughs) but here's the thing do they get back together like immediately and then 30 years later they break up and now she's looking back on it like oh that childhood relationship or do they end up together because the way that she says it they end up together like he puts her through it but they end up together so back when we did um back when we did our love story breakdown we had two things did jenny take did betty take james back um uh, assuming yes explains that the maybe james and betty did get back together at least into adulthood and that explains the line to kissing cars in downtown bars mm. um so that was like a that was like a small hint very very small i think we said assuming no tried to change the ending again to, a thing that we've been ta- i think has been like a theme over the last three or four episodes is that um ralph or the um robert frost poem that uh, mm-hmm. i chose uh, the two roads blah, blah blah i chose one and it made all the difference like like in that poem, the ambiguity of that road being the right choice wasn't made. They tried to change the ending. She never says that he did or didn't. Mm-hmm. She never says that like he succeeded or failed at trying to change the ending. So that is a, another point. And I made the joke when we were texting about it, like when we were talking like break like crazy about all this stuff. Of like, I think it's just James didn't do the dishes one night and Betty got really upset and started thinking about all the other times that he betrayed her or didn't or didn't live up to expectations. She like, just looks out the window like vintage <laughs> tea. It's like vintage tea in the sink. <laughs> didn't wash or even rinse. <laughs> like, could you imagine? Like, mm-hmm. I, I can see it. They're still together. Because I can tell you right now, there are times when I'm in a relationship with someone and we had a big fight. Like, I'll still lament over those fights mm-hmm. or things like that while we're in a relationship. But those don't just go away. If anything, they might be even exacerbated when you're still in the relationship because you're constantly being reminded of them because you're seeing the person yeah. that did it there. So I think it's it's definitely feasible i don't like it as much i don't i think it's better if they didn't get back together mm-hmm. um but i think that's something we should definitely break i, I think the uh, one of the things i'm going to mention a lot in this episode is a lot of the stuff that we learned from these um interviews where we've already done nine to ten of these songs uh yeah. song breakdowns so we might have to do a couple of should have said so's at the end of our last few uh next few episodes so like really break down a lot of the stuff we learn mm-hmm. um one other thing i noticed uh was really cute uh at the end of the cardigan uh performance she laughs and says this was so fun and it sounds exactly the way she says it at the end of stay 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 in red from red i don't think it was an intentional i think it's literally just taylor being taylor but i think that's so cool that like mm-hmm. Taylor being Taylor is the same Taylor from Red, even though she's so different. Yeah, yeah. like she's a lot more mature, and just older. It doesn't feel like the same Taylor at all. Mm-mm. It feels like it feels like every era she's she's like the uh, to pull a really big nerd reference. She's like the Doctor from Doctor Who, where she just dies and gets reincarnated as a new Taylor with a new look and a new outlook and a new style and everything like that. Um, so it's, it's cool to see like the continuity between her. Like she still laughs and talks and says things the same way. Mm-hmm. Uh, moving on to the next song, Last Great American Dynasty. Apparently she's wanted to record about a song about Rebecca Harkness since 2013, which you pointed out is before 1989. Wow. Mm-hmm. And she talked about how Aaron sent her a track and she's never felt like she had a song that would be able to support you know, the story of an entire life. And she's like, oh my God, I think this is my opening. I think this is my moment. I think I can write the Rebecca Harkness story. And 
Jack chimes in. He goes, oh, it's such a folklore moment to me because it's not about you, but it's all about you. <laughs> I, I, like, I'm going to tell you, like, Jack's interludes and, like, and interruptions are, are really good. <laughs> yeah. And then they go into this whole thing about how the song is modeled after a country narrative where, you know, this guy did this thing and this lady did this thing. And then they had a baby and I was that kid. Like, <laughs> <laughs> no, I love, I love that she mentions that too. Cause that is like such a great trope of like, kind of like the, the country music is the M night Shyamalan of music where it's just like, I'll, I'll just start singing about a random guy. You don't know who this guy is. It could be anyone, <gasps> but it's me. <laughs> like, exactly. I'm the person behind the mask. You would have never known. No. And she loves the song and honestly watching her perform it and watching her talk about it just makes me appreciate it more. It is pretty low on my list, but I'm like, all right, I get it. She, she, she has a really soft spot for this song and I really can't mm -hmm. blame her. It's something it, it especially with like it being seven years in the making of like having this idea but like like she said like in in her interview she was like i feel like most of my songs have to be about me she uh she mentions it in her in her interview with Alyssa during a affairs which we'll get into later but like she's like all of these all of my music i've always felt like this has to be about me has to be something that like someone would read in a tabloid or a headline or something like that like that's what i write about and knowing that she's had these ideas of things she wanted to write but felt like she couldn't because she was constrained by that feeling mm -hmm. makes me really excited for future taylor and seeing like what other songs from way back when did she have ideas for but just couldn't fit them in the pieces and i think it's good to know that like she doesn't care about fitting into those pieces anymore and one mm -hmm. thing I mentioned or that she mentioned right at the top of the show was the fact that she mentioned to her label, Hey, I did this album. I'm putting it out next week. Like she literally a week, she gave them a week's notice. Uh, and they, and they said, sure. And she was like, I'm so sorry. Like it doesn't have a major single. It doesn't have pop, blah, blah. And they're like, we trust you do whatever you want. And like the fact that she's getting that like green light from her, from her record label makes me think that she is going to do whatever she wants going forward and i'm really because excited. people will eat it up mm -hmm. it's taylor swift like you have her on your label you'll be fine you, you you're gonna make she's a she's a golden goose she's just gonna keep making you money yeah so moving on to the next song exile just casually brings up yes yeah, so we know william bowery is joe alwyn another just by the way like I love how she like it's like she just like I get to see her gathering papers and like putting it shuffling together on her desk and go all right this is what the internet thinks this is what the <laughs> internet thinks let's debunk let's mythbusters all of these things <laughs> and I saw someone on Twitter who wrapped it up perfectly it's you know when we thought that Joe could have been William Bowery we thought all right well she's writing a song and he's like she's like what do you think about this line babe and he's like Mm -hmm. uh, maybe maybe change it to this song she's like oh good good observation no this man wrote the entire piano part to exile and that entire first verse of i can see you standing honey with his arms around your body laughing but the joke's not funny at all like what like joe it's so nuts to me of course of course she's dating someone who is equally as talented as her of course and you would never why, picture why it. Like, would she have been less? we don't really know that much about Joe Alwyn. We just know he's an actor, but apparently he's a like, fantastic piano player, a songwriter now. Yeah. But like, but not even like songwriter. Again, like we, we gush over Taylor Swift's, um, what's the word we're looking for? Like improvisation to just think of a song and, or, and, and write the lyrics in like the moment. Mm -hmm. And apparently Joe can do that too. Like, apparently her Just, literal other half like mm -hmm. oh my gosh and then i wonder joe, if i wonder if we're gonna see joe and taylor like as a collaborative album if something like that like i feel like this was definitely a dip in the toes in and she mentioned like she didn't mm -hmm. know how she felt about writing with him blah 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 but i wonder if we'll see like a uh, jay-z beyonce <laughs> album come out <laughs> Maybe. I'm just curious. I kind of want Exile to win that Grammy now because I'm curious if he would go up there with her. I don't know if they do it in person. Oh, well, yeah, true. Forgot Corona is still awful. You could do virtual um, Grammys. Have like a, a web a video that she sends like she did for the last few. Yeah, maybe. 
And then I love how Joe and Taylor are just both big Boney Bear fans, but she was afraid to ask Darren to ask or ask Aaron to ask him. And she's like, you know, here's the song. I was picturing it'd be a duet. I don't know who with, who would it be with? Who do oh you God. think would be good with this? <laughs> like, I don't know. You tell me. And he's like, yeah, I think, you know, I think Justin would love this. And she's like, oh, cool. I didn't even think of Justin. Who's Justin? Now, is that Justin Vernon or is that Justin? <laughs> yeah. This was all you, babe. You made this mm-hmm. decision, not me. <laughs> yeah. And that's just so relatable. Just like, oh, yeah, I couldn't handle getting rejected. So I'm going to have you bring up the idea. And then I'll just think, wow, what a great idea. Wish I thought of it. All right. So on to your favorite song. Yes. Okay. So My Tears Ricochet. This was the first song she wrote off of the album. And she wrote it alone. Which I feel like I've heard conflicting things about the first song she's written off this album. Like, I thought it was the one in the ho- uh, in hoax and there were like bookends I, I or was that they just wrote them at the same time i think it might have been they wrote them at the same time i i mean she said in the thing this is this is the first thing i've written um it's the it's the second time that um we've had a track five be the first song she's written for the mm-hmm. album yeah um it might she it could also first song written could mean a lot of things it could mean first completed song it could mean first song that she wrote all of the lyrics and had them nailed down to, maybe mm-hmm. not the production behind it. First song that she had the lyrics and the production written down but didn't record it first. It could also um, be the first song that she wrote, but not the first song she wrote for the album. Yeah, that's a good mm-hmm. point too. This is the first yeah. song she's ever written. You're right, yeah. Well, no, but just... She wrote about, about Scooter when she was 12 years no, old. No, sequentially, <laughs> sequentially. Yeah when she yeah. wrote it and then she was like oh i should put it on this album uh she said she wrote it alone it's one of the saddest songs off the album and then jack antonoff kissing her butt saying oh it's one of the best songs you've ever written and that's yes, why it's you, that's why you picked it for a track five and she goes on to say you know picking a track five is sort of this pressurized decision and he just glosses over it and doesn't question her and i'm like get into that that's like that's <laughs> the stuff we want to know yeah, because she could have to face another like slideshow from me about it if she puts the wrong track five on there again. <laughs> again. She, she talks about the songs about karma, greed, how someone can be your best friend, companion, most trusted person, to all of a sudden they're your worst enemy who knows exactly how to hurt you. Uh, she compares it to divorce in that kind of setting, which I think is great. Um, and then in the actual song itself, at the very end, she says, look at all of my tears turning into your tears, which is a line that was not included on the original version. I love that. I love the ad-libbing at the end mm-hmm. and like just changing some things around, just seeing what, what she likes. I love, I love that she did that. Yeah. But that was a really interesting one for me because we all kind of know what the song's about to her just confirming like, yeah, this is a very sad song. What you thought? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> So the next song we go into is Mirrorball, which apparently is directly connected to This Is Me Trying, which I don't know if either one of us picked up on. Nope, not even a little bit. Mm-hmm. And I'm very disappointed in me. Uh, she said she wrote the song after learning that all of her shows were canceled, so Loverfest. And do you want to talk about the rest? Yeah, it's, it's amazing to me how far off we, in ways we were. Like I said in the beginning, I think... Obviously, she wrote with a lot of double meanings in mind, and there are some things we couldn't know about mm-hmm. herself and how she's feeling and stuff like that and why she's writing what she is. Um, but, yeah, no, it's <laughs> – I will say, for me, I can't get over it. Uh, the absolute gall of Taylor just saying, I've never been a natural. It just – and then to defend it and say, that's how I felt. Yeah. You might not be a natural at, I don't know, croquet or something, but Jesus Christ, you were the most naturally gifted musician in the world and songwriter in the world to be able to get up at 3 a.m. go to your piano and belt out lover. Yeah. Like, I'm sorry. You're an, you're, you're a natural at this. Mm-hmm. So focus on that. Um, but I like, there was a, uh, in that interview, um, I'm going to pull this out because this is secretly a Fall Out Boy podcast as well. Um, but she mentioned, she says, we have people like that. In, she, she talks about how the album is very indicative of like people who uh, are put up on this pedestal 
uh, like a, like a mirror ball, and they only, and they shine because they're broken. Um, and she says we have people like that in society. Every time they break, it entertains us. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and there is a Fall Out Boy lyric that I really enjoy called "My" that says "My heart is like a stallion. They love it more when it's broken." Um, and I love the ideal for literally every artist in the world. We just idolize their sad music. Like mm-hmm. be more we, like when Taylor Swift breaks up or. But, back when she was breaking up with people be like oh my god we're getting a new album like yeah like, why are we excited about that why are we excited about taylor swift breaking up because we're gonna get it we're gonna enjoy all, like enjoy off of her suffering and mm-hmm. like there's this whole thing we could go into about like how to be an artist you must suffer and you that's how you do it and like we only subscribe there's a lot into there there's a lot to unpack there um but i i had to relate it to that fallout boiler because it's the first thing that i i thought of but she also breaks out the dictionary for this one again. Uh, she just loves pulling out these words. And you know duplicitous is a word she loves. So she mentioned mm-hmm. the word duplicitous, saying that um, we get uh, uh, people put on different faces for different people. Um, we get a confirmation again that the double lyrical meaning with the song being about a celebrity, but also being able to relate to the masses of people who have all of these different versions of yourselves. You're a different person around your parents. You're a different mm-hmm. person around your friends, your coworkers, your church, if you go to one like all of that, like you're just, you have a million different personalities and you just like swap faces for yeah. each situation you're in. Um, one of the things, the other thing that was really uh, interesting she mentioned is she did say, this is one of the few times that the pandemic specifically is addressed. Did we even mention that there was, we didn't find any signs of the pandemic in this song specifically, but she said like- um, The whole bridge. The whole bridge is all that. Like they burnt, they uh, called off the circus, burned the disco down um it's insane to me that we miss it but i also liked um i did not like that my entire thesis about try uh her saying trying everything to get you laughing at me uh is now postponed we'll have to get to that in another later date but she mentioned that that lyric being like she's still on that tightrope she's still trying to stay in the spotlight even though all of her shows got canceled yeah like she could just take a hiatus but instead she's still choosing to write these songs and put out this album and say hey i'm still here like i'm still here for you um, all right, so the next song, Seven, I don't really have a lot about this. This was a really short interlude. Mm-hmm. Um, Taylor mentioned how she always wondered about the last time she threw a tantrum, like when that Which was. you mentioned. Yeah, like it's mm-hmm. it's really cool like to see like Seven, like you, you you think about that as a kid, like when was the last time you did X? When, like there was that, that meme going around that was one time your friends knocked up on your door and asked you to come out to play and it was the last time you all played together mm-hmm. and you don't know when that was. Oh, I hate that right um but like uh that's the thing like jack had another really good interlude in here where he said like um this this was a a triple box this was uh, all three of them together but uh taylor says yeah like i when when did i stop doing that why did i stop doing that and jack goes well where does it go like you still have Mm -hmm. that feeling there Mm -hmm. are times where you still feel like throwing a tantrum but like where does it go like where does that feel like some people let it out in different ways now you learn to cope you learn to do things in a different way that's such a great um, but I think point it's, a, it's really cool like, yeah mm-hmm. no i loved i love that that's why i said like i love the interviews out of this so the next one this was a huge one August. so i might i might put it in the video but i have the just the text exchange between us of just us going crazy because she just so casually goes, yeah, I think she has a name, you know, like people have been saying, you know, Inez, but it's not that. Like, I think I picture her as like an Augusta or an Augustine. And we're just like, even Jack was like, excuse me. Yeah. He's like, like, Oh, she was nameless to me, but I guess that changes things. It it literally does. Like I completely agree with Jack. Like for Mm -hmm. me, it makes it, um, it makes it harder to believe that Jetty, James and Betty ended up, I keep saying Jetty, because I guess that's their, that's their, their They're couple o- name. Oh God, we just coined a term. That's going to, Betty and James are now Jetty, uh, ended up together. It's easier if she's nameless. That means that she me- she meant nothing to James, blah, blah, blah. Like it makes it easier for me to believe they got back together, but giving her a name makes it real. Uh, it's like when your parent, when you, when you find a stray dog and your parents say, don't give it a name. Cause then you'll never want to give it up. Mm-hmm. It's that kind of thing. So I don't know how I feel about giving your name. What name do you lean towards? Uh, Augustine. I, I think. That's funny. I lean toward mm-hmm. Augusta. 100%. Really? Yep. I just, I, I, I don't like the name Augusta. I don't like either of these names. I think they're both trash, but yeah, I just <laughs> don't like, I just don't like the name 
like Augusta. August maybe, but like Augusta just sounds like very like old fashioned German to me. Like I think of Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. Okay. Like Augustus. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Getting stuck in the chocolate. Um, Jack loves playing August. He looks like a kid in a Charlie the Chocolate Factory. <laughs> there's, like, a, there's a video, remind me to send it to you. And it's just a compilation of Jack throughout the song playing it. And he just gets increasing and we're like. <laughs> he's like it was like hunches over and is yeah. like, like goober face. It's really funny. Um, he was also talking about like, he, he was mentioning like how fun it was to, for Aaron to experience Taylor Swift in a writing room. Mm-hmm. Um, and he was like talking about, well, all right, well, Taylor will come in and be like, here's the bridge. All right, now here's a better bridge. All right, now here is the best bridge for this song. Uh, and just like, she, she wrote the bridge for August in the vocal booth. Mm-hmm. In the vocal booth, like while she was recording, she just wrote that bridge. Yeah. Never been a natural, screw you. <laughs> <laughs> Are you kidding me? Wrote the, one of the best bridges on this album on the fly yeah Um, insane she also goes on to point out that augusta isn't a bad girl and i'm gonna call her that because that's it's my augusta um isn't a bad girl like she genuinely fell for james she didn't try to be a homewrecker she wanted Mm -hmm. she wanted to be she thought they had something special she thought they had a connection and then like it goes on to say like she had to pretend like she didn't matter she had to pretend like she didn't care Mm-hmm. Um, but it's really cool. She she goes on to say like, "There's no villain girl in the story." You always think when you hear these things that there was this home wrecker girl that came in and and stole the guy from the girl, and she's the one that we don't like, or something along those lines. Or even she came and rescued the guy from the bad girlfriend that she that he didn't that didn't appreciate him or something. Mm-hmm. But there's no villain girl. That we just have James. Yeah, just James and, and just James. And no one's happy about just James. Um, <laughs> I can't, I'm sorry, this is like a little thing for me. Because ever since you sent me that Lord thing, I've just, I've just gone off the Jack hate train. But Jack goes, this situation feels very close to me. I bet it does, Jack. I really do. I bet it feels really close. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. Love triangle, weird, huh? That's huh, crazy. Jack. Crazy. Um, she also says that uh, she wrote the the lyric "Meet Me Behind the Mall" in a note on her phone like a while ago, and that's where she always wanted to inject it in a song. And I mm-hmm. love I love hearing more about her songwriting process and the fact that she probably has an, a note that's words I like and note that's like lines I think are cool and like yeah. just trying to slot them in every time she's in the studio. Mm-hmm. I think is really awesome. One hundred percent. The next uh, so song. The, this is me trying another whiff from us. I. So I don't, was it, was it Aaron who t- talks about it? But basically, no, or, it, 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 this was a, this was a uh, lawn chair um, chat with uh, just Jack and just Taylor. So Taylor starts off the interview by saying, you know, I've been thinking about addiction a lot lately and just, you know, people who suffer from mental illness or addiction. And both of us just went, oh, like this song makes 10 times more sense in like we kind of, we don't, I don't even think we thought mental illness, either of them. No. I think just um, that frames we thought, it. We thought it meant like you screwing up, you screwing mm-hmm. something up in a relationship. Like that's where we immediately went to. And I think that's because of how we connected it to the, the love triangle. Mm-hmm. Like we just assumed that they were all together. It's so interesting now to learn how disjointed all of these songs are when we thought they were so connected. Yeah. Like it's insane. Mm-hmm. Like, at least I'm trying. Like, so many lines in the song just make 10 times more sense. <clears throat> it's it's nuts. They have, like, really great points. And, like, I see this in a lot of my friends who suffer from mental illness. Like, um, Taylor saying, you have no idea how close I am to going back to a dark place. Like, any moment I could just slip and and be depressed again or something along those lines. And then Jack even had, like what I think is the best thing of, like, you have no mm-hmm. idea how hard it is to get to the point that is still crappy like i'm trying so hard to be what you still think is the worst version of me yeah like like it's stuff like that that's just like it really gets you and it's it's insane to like point out and think about Mm -hmm. um taylor also goes on to say that the second verse is more geared towards people who excelled in school 
and then once they got into the real world there were less gold stars to hand out there there weren't as there weren't a curriculum to follow stuff like that yeah it just gets harder and you feel like you just you fall behind after feeling for so long feeling like you were ahead uh which i think is another interesting point for this song i don't know like i don't i never liked this song but i think of all the songs in the album i might like the idea and the and the lyrics and the meaning behind it more than most of the other ones just because it's it's so versatile mm-hmm. the next few get really low like there's not there wasn't too many like revelations about them yeah um illicit affairs taylor mentions that it's allowed to exist in its own merit without being associated with taylor directly so like there she goes again biographical yeah. She goes again with saying like, oh yeah, by the way, this isn't about me. It definitely isn't about me. And it's like, it's all right. It's about Jack. Like, no, but yeah, no, she's, she's like, she's very much making it a point that like, I don't have to write songs about me anymore. Songs, I don't have to write what's in the headlines. Mm-hmm. I don't have to inform my fans about how I'm doing or what I'm doing. Um, I can write about whatever. And I think that's awesome. Like, I, like I said, I'm really excited to see her go through that. Uh, because that's the thing is like when you're a when you're a, a fiction writer or like uh or something like that you george r. r martin isn't writing about stuff that happened to him no he's no one's out here like wow i bet you george was really ned stark for a while like no like so it's cool like why is that why in songs do we have to have a a biographical component to it no she could write about anything yeah it's just and the I, expectation that she's had for so long and she can finally say, you know what? Like, I don't have to do this anymore. She has a label that trusts her and she has the clout to be able to do whatever she wants and mm-hmm. get away with it, really. Um, and she said it's a different experience, Taylor. Like, it's it's a different thing that she's branching up to. She's doing good. She's saying yes instead of no. Um, yeah. So I think that's, like, really cool. Um, we go to Invisible String, uh, which is which is the exact opposite <laughs> of Elizabeth Perry. Uh, she does mention it is a bit of an autobiographical song. It is about Joe and Taylor. Mm-hmm. Um, she does do a deep dive into fate, which I think is really cool, which I think we'll actually talk about later. Um, and she also said she wrote the song right after she sent an, an ex a baby gift. So mm-hmm. way to go, Joe. Jonas. Oh, that's so funny. The next song we get into is Mad Woman, and she just talks about female rage. Like, she said that she was sent the track, and she's like, oh, this is what female rage sounds like. It's the, these o- ominous strings, and you wrote that ominous strings are female rage and invisible strings are fate. <laughs> We're learning about the different strings. <laughs> mm-hmm. And she writes that, um, you know, recently with somebody who's very guilty of this in my life, she's talking about gaslighting. Um, and it's a person who makes me feel or tries to make me feel like I'm the offender by having any kind of defense to his offenses. And it's just, it's perfect. And you know exactly what the song's about. You know that Jack and Aaron are just sitting there like, yeah, we know. <laughs> like, we know it's about Scooter Braun. We get it. Don't mm-hmm. worry. We get yeah. it. Um, the, I think the best quote that she has is just, this response is treated like or the response to the offense is treated like the offense itself. And I think mm-hmm. that's the best way to put it into words. Um, what What is going on with her and going on with so many, honestly, so many women. Just the, the gaslighting. Mm-hmm. I, this whole country has been gaslit. Anyways, um, <laughs> then we get into the next song, Epiphany. And so she wanted a song like she wanted a string arrangement. She's like, you know, I really want to do some strings. And so this song was unlike anything that she'd ever heard. And I'm mad because when Erin sent this to her, she was like, I kind of wanted to do a sports song because of the last dance. (laughs) And we were just like, no. (laughs) Like Epiphany, this like emotional, like wartime song was almost about sports. Almost about Michael Jordan. Mm Mm-hmm. I'm still here to hear a Taylor Swift sports song. I wonder what that would be like, but we definitely didn't get it. (laughs) No, thank God. And I just love the fact that she goes into this whole explanation about how the songs about her grandfather fighting in World War II at Guadalcanal and this really bloody battle that he's never even spoken about. Like people would ask and he would just never divulge. So she really tried to put herself into his shoes like, 
what must have that what must have that been like to not even be able to speak about it and some things you just can't speak about like years later too mm. no it's it's really interesting she she makes a point um like in this song specifically saying like um one Aaron shows that he's blown away uh, by the talent of Taylor being able to write and add to his music and make it feel like they're in the same room, even though they were miles apart. Mm -hmm. Um, But it's, I think that the best quote that I think probably might be my favorite from the entire special was, and this is a loose quote. I'm not writing it verbatim, but she said there were times in her life that she felt like she was falling apart and it felt like she was pushed out of an airplane and just was scratching at the air on the way down. But the universe is just doing its thing. There's nothing she can do to fight it. It's just her life is coming apart. Mm-hmm. And um, she then says to Aaron, she said, every time, ever since I started making music with you, it felt like the universe was just forcing these puzzle pieces into place. And there was nothing I could do about it. Like there was nothing I could do to stop this music, this awesome music from happening. And I think that's something that's really interesting. Like it made me think like back on my life, like there were definitely points in my life that were going really, really, really well. And I never realized like there is nothing. Sometimes there is nothing you can do to stop it. And we always associate that with the negative. We never associate that with the positive. Mm-hmm. Um, it reminds me of the, the Luke Combs song, When It Rains, It Pours, because it mm. does the exact same thing of like, you think, oh, when it rains, it pours, it's bad. Well, sometimes when it rains, it pours, it's good. Yeah. Sometimes. And, and we never notice it. We never notice it. We never think about it. And I think if we spent more time thinking about the moments of the good raining and pouring, it might help offset the, the bad. Mm-hmm. There was your therapy session in the middle of <laughs> an hour Thank into this you. podcast. <laughs> <laughs> All right. On to the big one. <sighs> This is where Joe gets to to boast a bit. All right. Uh, Betty, uh, do you want to read that uh, that first line there? Uh, No. Evan, do you want to read that one for me? This is Taylor Swift yet again just saying, nah, nah, miss me with that gay stuff. (laughs) Saying Saying that James is a dude definitively. And she goes, you know, like, and even even Jack Antonoff is like trying to like help us out. He's like, well, uh, is- the inter- he even specifically said the internet. He said the internet thinks blah blah blah. And she goes, well, I wrote it, so I confirmed it. I yep, We're, we wrote it. I'm confirming it. Um, mm-hmm. And she says like, I think she tried to play coy about it a little bit because like she was saying he he was foolish. He was foolish. He was foolish. And Jack's like, well, we don't know that. And and she's like, he was foolish. And like. I'm right. I wrote it. We confirm it. So that make the, the, inter- the exchange makes it sound like there, there was question about James actually being foolish. There is no question. James was being foolish. The question was, is there an S before that? He, mm-hmm. and, uh, and Taylor confirmed James is a dude. I don't uh, even think Jack and Aaron knew because when people would ask them about it, they were like, well, I don't know. Like it's up for interpretation. Well, and like, James how- didn't even know that August had a name. Mm-hmm. Like, I yeah. think it's so cool. Like Taylor has all this stuff in her head and she just, and like the way that she says it here, it's, it's very like, it's very like, uh, yeah. I, how did you not know that? I knew that from the beginning. Like it's exactly how a writer is. <laughs> like, yeah. So um, before we should also another, just like a string of confirmations. We mentioned in our love triangle episode that it was never actually confirmed by Taylor herself, which three songs were part of the love triangle leaving room to debate is illicit affairs, a part of it, blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. But she has finally put that to bed. It is Betty Cardigan in August. She explicitly said that in the, uh, in the interview. Um, and I love that uh, Aaron and Taylor made cardigan, Jack and Taylor made August. And then they all made Betty together, mm-hmm. which I think is really cool. Like, interesting piece to it yeah like the triangle of the triangle of writers (laughs) Mm -hmm. exactly um so then we have joe alwyn back at it again with the entire chorus of betty oh my gosh like who is this man it's so nuts to me like i can't fathom uh my favorite was um the, the when they mentioned it Taylor was like, yeah, I heard Joe singing the full chorus from another room and I like popped my head in and Jack goes, hello, uh, I do this professionally. I would like to have a conversation with you. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> like he's like, oh, I hear that you're really good at this. Can we get his? Can we set something up on Zoom and yeah. uh, and discuss this a little bit? <laughs> and he also was like, like it, Taylor mentioned to him, like, yeah, like I wrote a song with me and Joe wrote a song, and Jack was like, oh, I thought it was like when you write a like dumb a song about your cat or something, like it was a joke or something. Yeah. Like that. Not like, oh no, we wrote a full fledged. This is going to be on an album song. That's so crazy to me. Yeah. I, I could you imagine like I, it, it, that's got to feel amazing to have a partner that like you didn't even expect like because you can tell she wasn't expecting this to come out of him no. um and to be able to do something you love as much as taylor loves songwriting with your significant other has got to be mm-hmm. some of the most rewarding things she's ever had she, she says even in the in the thing she was very trepidatious to write a song with joe because she was just afraid of how it was going to work mm-hmm. and how they were going to work together um, but she's very happy with how it went on. She said that uh, she imagined the course being sung by a guy. She thought it would be better sung by a guy. Um, and she said like it was it, it felt perfect because she had written so many songs from a girl's point of view, wanting a boy's apology. And this feels like the apology she'd always wanted. Yeah. Oh, what a song. It's great. So the peace de resistance. Peace. Uh, peace. <laughs> Um, we get a little bit about this. Aaron says that uh, he sent her the instrumental in the beginning and Taylor felt this, this peace. Like it was just such, that, that was the first word that came to mind and it felt like such a peaceful instrumental. But I can't imagine they had that beeping in, the, in that instrumental mm-hmm. because that beeping is anxiety driven. Yeah. That is not a peaceful part. All of like the, like that whole part. Very Yeah. Peaceful. Wonderful. The, the, no, that, that's anxiety driven. Mm-hmm. Um, but I also love, we also hear Aaron <laughs> talking about like learning about Taylor's bridges in this song. We're like, we get to the bridge of peace and he's like, oh, we can do that. Like we can go anywhere with this. Oh my gosh. Like he literally was like, we can do literally anything. Like you let me know that, um, which I think is really cool. We also mm-hmm. learn like this is a very personal song to Taylor, which makes sense. The song feels very personal. It feels very pointed and about very hard to discuss things. Um, Taylor says she like she with her career and everything, she always feels like there is an elephant in the room and she doesn't mm-hmm. want it to be there. Um, and the, she ends it by saying like there's all this like the song basically boils down to there is all of this stuff that i can't control but is the stuff that i can control enough for you mm-hmm. um and and that's how i've always wanted this song to be described to me honestly and she yeah. she points it out that like i wrote it about me and like the media and like i can't control if there's a guy with a telescopic lens taking photos of you or you get a text saying tabloids are writing x about you because of me and then and Aaron comes in and goes, look, like, yeah, I get that that's what that's your thing. But like, he's like, I suffer from from mental illness. Like I have depression and like I go up and down. It makes it very hard to be in a relationship or be married to mm. me. And it's something I can't control. That's chemical balances in my brain. And it's so I think that this might be one of the most important songs she's ever written. Like it just gave me, so, I already appreciated the heck out of this song yeah. and just hearing them talk about it and like having Aaron point out like, Hey, yeah, I know you, like he, he said it like in the same way we say about mm-hmm. her all the time where it's like, like all too well, wow, you wrote this really specific song to a very specific point in your breakup, but somehow we can, anyone can relate to it and, and yeah. pull out what they need to pull out of this song to feel the right thing. Um, I can't say enough about peace. I when can't he, wait yeah. to do the breakdown. When he went on that whole tangent about it, it's. I feel like everyone who has suffered with from mental illness just instantly went, "Yep, that's it." Same. That's the one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, it's it's crazy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right, two more. Yes. Then we get into hoax, uh, which Taylor says hoax is another word that she loves. It's a word with an X. Uh, she says it embodies all. Taylor the- always loves an X. <laughs> <laughs> it embodies all of the themes of the album, which he says are confessions, nature, emotional uh, validity, and a- ambiguity together, and love that isn't just easy. And she says, you know, she's writing the song, and she asked Aaron for advice because she said, you know, I feel like what if I'm writing about very different fractured feelings about different people? Like this one thing is about like a business relationship and this one thing is about another thing. And, you know, 
he pushed her forward and he's like, nope, like do the thing that makes you uncomfortable. Like with the national, we have songs that aren't just about this one specific thing. They can kind of be pulled from all these different experiences. And she, you know, feels that she's always knowing exactly what she's writing about. So this kind of made her feel uncomfortable. And it's very reassuring to feel that she still gets uncomfortable. Like, you know, at the level that she's at, she's still unsure about certain things and still challenging herself, which makes me think that we still have yet to see what she can fully do, which is very exciting as a Taylor Swift fan. Um, Then she goes on to say, you know, the line, it still hurts underneath my scars from when they pulled me apart. Anyone in her life knows about what she's talking about. And I think there's a lot of things, but I think definitely, I think she's talking about just the media right before Mm -hmm reputation just how she was ripped to shreds forced to go into hiding oh yeah definitely Mm -hmm. and then she says the lion don't want no other shade of blue but you no other sadness in the world would do is what she thinks love really is like who would you want to be sad with when there's gray skies every day for months would you still stay and that's just such a beautiful line i love like how her viewpoints of love have shifted Mm -hmm. over like the last eight eight or nine years like it's so interesting to see and how much it just shows how much she's matured and everything Mm -hmm. it's got to be cool for her to look back and see all of that too exactly so then we get to the last song off the album the bonus track the bonus track but the secret last song Mm -hmm. um so she does she gushes over the escapism on this track uh and the lakes yeah sorry the the album is the lakes or the the song is the lakes um and she goes into like this giant thing about william wordsworth john keats all moving to the poets district in the lakes uh district of um of england and she she went there with joe and like and explored around and she was like she's like i can see doing this like of course they did this why wouldn't they why wouldn't all these poets move here (laughs) um so beautiful it's so beautiful and it's so perfect. And she said like, uh, she's been writing about getting out like a college escape plan for years. And, and Jack like immediately goes, Oh my gosh, you have, you've been writing about this for forever. Mm-hmm. Um, and she, she says that the lakes, the song is about the people who went and did it. And she just kept saying that over and over again. She's like, you did it. You did it. Like you did it. You did it. You did it. Like she just kept going on about how it's insane that these people actually did this thing Mm-hmm. Um, that she feels like she's always secretly wanted to do. And she says that the overarching thing she felt while writing folklore was not being able to go to the lakes or anywhere right now, but because she was writing folklore, it was like she was going there in her head. Mm-hmm. I think it's really cool. Like, again, that's how you get all this escapism from this song, all of this non-autobiographical work, all of this stuff like that, that like helped her get out. Um, and then Jack ends it um, with saying like the the hope is not i can't do this i'm gone like i'm out um the hope is that i found something worth escaping with or something worth someone worth escaping with Mm -hmm. Um, and then taylor mentions it was the perfect switch to the ending of the album she loved hoax as an end cap like like you said she wrote Mm -hmm. hoax and the one together as the beginning and the end of the the album but she wanted to she came in with a later ending she wanted to release it later so you get like this is what you thought the ending was but this is what the actual ending is um and it wraps it up a little bit differently it makes you think differently about the album which was really cool um and then we we end with i think a really beautiful rendition of the song Mm -hmm. Uh, again i think this album definitely lends itself to a small club scene with like like a speakeasy flapper style uh, album and I think the lakes is one of the perfect ones for that too mm-hmm. oh so any closing statements besides her going whiskey <laughs> whiskey <laughs> this was a long episode sorry mm-hmm. guys for for pulling you all into it the last things I just want to say is that the credits were even great um yeah. we learned that it was record the the record was recorded at uh Lake Pond Session or Lake Pond Studio um or long pond long pond studio Mm -hmm. uh jack's house and taylor's home studio which jack goes did you ever name that she says yes it's named kitty committee studios uh and we go in to hear about her her cats and how i have the same problem of Mm -hmm. you can't shut a door with a cat because they will start going crazy she says they need to be they need to have free reign be cage free cats um and then goes on to like we see all of this fighting of her cats behind her while she's talking and trying to record and she calls them the marshmallow wars where no one actually gets hurt but they just keep throwing punches (laughs) 
Uh, but those are the only closing statements I have, which I thought were just watching the ending was really cool. Yeah, I think the whole thing is fantastic. I think it's a really cute thing to add. I think finally we're given some clarification about what the album is actually about from the mouth herself. Just like I said, she had a she had a PowerPoint of all of the the, the things that we were talking about and goes, mm-hmm. all right, well, I'm going to confirm and deny a bunch of them. Yep. Um, I don't think we should go too much longer. I think we can wrap no. up a little bit quickly. So uh, if you like what you hear from us, uh, be sure to give us a review and a five-star rating on Apple. Uh, tell a friend about us. If you, if you really enjoy us, the, the easiest way for us to grow this podcast is for you guys to share us with your friends, followers, and, and uh, family. Yes. And uh, make sure to follow us on social media and subscribe to our YouTube channel to see our lovely faces. We are on Facebook instagram youtube at we need to calm down podcast and twitter at wntcd podcast if you guys have a suggestion for an episode drop us a comment or a dm uh we love hearing from you guys and we love making new episodes hopefully taylor calms down a little bit actually no don't keep going keep bringing us stuff (laughs) aside from that thank you for listening we will see you this thursday for the next episode come back we'll be here